comrades. We heard this morning, uh, and no doubt we'll hear further this afternoon, about the reality of poverty in our society. As Northern Ireland entered the pandemic, and that was two years ago now, nearly one in five people in Northern Ireland lived in poverty, including over 100,000 children. Some groups are, of course, impacted by poverty more than others, with disabled people locked out of the labour market, carers being at huge risk of poverty, and nearly four in 10 single parent families being in poverty. The negative consequences of poverty are generally worse for families the longer they spend in poverty and the deeper in poverty that they are. The disproportionately low incomes of many people in the rental sector, renters, together with high rents in the private sector, are among the key drivers of the high rates of poverty among renters. In the coming weeks, millions of households will be pushed into poverty by soaring food prices and energy costs to the extent that they will be unable to afford the basic necessities of life. Typical working age household incomes are set to fall by 4% in real terms in 2022 to 2023, a loss of 1,100 pounds, while the largest falls will be amongst the poorest quarter of households where incomes are set to fall by 6%. The lack of support offered by Chancellor uh, Rishi Sunak for low-income families in the recent spring statement means 1.3 million people will fall into what they describe as absolute poverty <coughs> in 2022-23. Even the UK government's own forecasters, the Office for Budget Responsibility, <coughs> said that UK households face the biggest drop in living standards since records began in the 1950s. The OBR said that wages are failing to keep up with prices as rap rapidly rising energy costs push inflation towards 9%, the highest level of inflation in 40 years. And higher energy bills will lead to further inflation, which in turn will put pressure on household consumption and further erode uh, incomes. Coupled with rising taxes, this fall in spending power will lead to a 2.2% fall in living standards, the largest drop on record. The current percentage decline in real pay is the, is, the, is the steepest since the late 1970s, while public sector pay is down 2.1% since the Tories came to power in 2010. Our so-called meritocratic system is in reality inherently discriminatory, being designed to maintain and reinforce the class structures that exist in our society. We live in a system which perpetuates the circle of privilege, for example, health inequalities have a number of causes, but poverty, unemployment, low pay, educational underachievement, and the lack of decent public housing all feature as key factors. All of these factors which arise under capitalism are being and will be compounded by an austerity culture. These are all class issues. There are many myths about the causes of poverty, usually based on the premise that those experiencing poverty and deprivation are themselves to blame, <coughs> the myth of the so-called undeserving poor. But poverty is not about poor choices. It's not an accident of history. It doesn't exist in a vacuum. The causes of poverty are structural and systemic. The social, political, and economic problems that plague the majority of our people are rooted in the system of private ownership. The concentration of private capital in few hands, the corporate accumulation of wealth, and the relentless and ruthless pursuit of profit at all costs. In other words, a working class united and conscious of its power as a class is necessary for change, for the revolutionary transformation of society, for the abolition of capitalism, and for the construction of a socialist society in which power is firmly in the hands of the workers, and where the wealth of society is used for the benefit of the people <coughs> and not the profit you. Every class struggle is a political struggle. The Workers' Party seeks to unite all workers, by which we mean all those who depend on a wage, including the unemployed and others receiving a social wage for their livelihood, and the exploited, self-employed and poor farmers, and to win them to the struggle for socialism. Charity, 
despite the genuine goodwill of those involved in, ha in helping alleviate the effects of poverty, will not prevent poverty. And of course, that doesn't take away from the excellent work that is done, and we hear some of it this afternoon, by charities that have kept people uh, uh, from starvation in our society. But only system change can achieve changes which will prevent poverty. Capital determines how our societies are organized. It produces poverty and inequality. And we will not and cannot escape that unless and until the power of capital is destroyed. There are, of course, interim measures the state can take to assist, and we have demanded the implementation of many of these, including permanent and stable work for all, with full social insurance, working and wage protection, full occupational health and safety measures, and full trade union rights, social protection for the sick, disabled, pensioners and the unemployed, obligatory public universal social protection, the satisfaction of health, education, welfare and housing needs, including a quality public universal and free system of health and medical care, free compulsory public secular education, a reduction in the retirement age, the payment of adequate pensions, democratic rights and changing and freedoms, an end to the privatisation of public assets, the maintenance of strategic sectors of the economy by the state, including energy, communications, education, transportation, environmental protection, etc. Jerry, any questions or make any comment, please feel free to come to the roster. For example, uh, the question of public utilities, and just to deal with one in particular, transportation. I mean, Trevor pointed out in some detail this morning the situation in which a private company, foreign owned by very wealthy people, can actually own a port an essential piece of infrastructure for this society to exist. In other words, in Northern Ireland, it controls the intake of supplies, supplies outgoing from Northern Ireland that are going to be exported. Those can be stopped by a private company that is unaccountable, and it's clear that P&O is unaccountable to the people and the taxpayers, despite the fact that the taxpayers have been funding them and funding their zones, their, their zones for years. Now, that example alone indicates, has, has two relevant uh, uh, factors in relation to what we're discussing today. One is that workers are paid off without warning or consultation. They lose their jobs. It's not only the 800 workers who are paid off, but there can be other jobs lost in the locality, in the area, which are dependent upon, uh, upon shipping and upon those ferries. That can impoverish whole families. <clears throat> It'll certainly impoverish those families who are dependent on a wage of one pound ninety pence per hour. Now, I don't know how you could possibly sit there and work out how a family can live, how many hours it would have to be worked by somebody working uh, for one pound ninety pence per hour to survive, to pay rent, to pay for utilities such as electricity and heat, to pay for food to school their children, to clothe their children, it could be done. To use the expression immoral doesn't even begin to describe what is happening here. Capitalism, the very essence of capitalism, is based on immorality and inequality. And I think that's why what I've tried to do this afternoon is to place both a historical and theoretical context in which the very real issues that uh, we have discussed this morning, and which I know Tony is going to discuss later this afternoon, those practical issues in which people in our society have to live. 